So again, welcome everybody to this third in our data analysis series. So we've covered basic data analysis. We've covered high dimensional data analysis within Flojo or related packages. And today we want to look at the principles of high dimensional analysis using approaches that aren't necessarily already bundled up into traditional flow cytometric programs. Those of you who've never been on these webinars before, my name is Derek Davis. I should have introduced myself a few seconds earlier, but I'm the STP or Science Technology Platform training lead here at the Francis Crick Institute in London. And for many years, I ran the core flow facility here. And you can follow the, the Crick Flow Lab on Twitter, or you can also follow me on Twitter. And right at the end of the, today's webinar, we'll give you some links to some other resources. Now, I wanted to invite um, Faris Naji, who I'll introduce you to now, to talk today. So Faris is from a company called Terson, although this is not a commercial seminar. But Faris has now a lot of um, experience in the sort of data uh, handling and analysis that we now want as cytometrists. I think the days of doing single or dual parameter analysis are all, almost behind us, not completely behind us, but with the advent of cytometers that can look at 15, 20, 25 colors, and with the advent of even spectral cytometry and mass cytometry, the need for high dimensional analysis is now much more apparent. So this is hopefully the start of your journey. So I will now hand over to, to Faris to give today's webinar. Thanks, Derek. Uh, thanks for inviting me, and I appreciate everybody who sh who, uh, who's listening and spending the hour with me about uh, high dimensional flow cytometry. So um, I'll start with my, uh, with, uh, without further ado, I'll start with my uh, slide. So Faris Nagy, I'm a co-founder of Person, and it's all about uh, high dimensional data. And uh, I started this company to address these issues. Um, we're, pan, we're pan European online type of company. We don't have like, fixed offices. But uh, here is what I'd like to achieve. I'd like to do a quick intro to Saito. So um, it, it ties in with uh, what Derek has been doing with the webinars from Crick, and I'm delighted to be part of that adventure and initiative. And then we're going to talk about high dimensional opportunities and challenge, challenges as well. Uh, and Person, of course, tries to answer some of them. And uh, I'll give you some advice in terms of quality control, exploring your data, clustering, which is the art of clustering, sometimes I call it, uh, biomarker discovery, uh, integrating with translational data. Um, so hopefully you'll enjoy it. Uh, on the right here, I talk about, or I, I put a, a very old uh, book from the 1800s, so the late 1800s, Edwin Abbott, and he wrote this book called Flatland, where he describes the journey of a square going uh, through uh, higher dimensions and meeting a sphere. And it's an adventure uh, of, 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 well, it's actually a critique on Victorian uh, um, culture, but it's, um, it's also a, a fascinating read about uh, dimension shifts. And it's called The Romance of Many Dimensions, and it's the story, and you can see here, written by S Square. And hopefully you're, you're part, you're like this, you're a square, because we are all 2D, 3D orientated in, in all these uh, higher dimensions that we'll be talking about. It. It's a journey upwards to, to that dimension. So we're here, what is the flow cytometry, where you basically have samples that have been already prepared with uh, conjugated uh, fluorochromes on, with antibodies on the surface of your cells. You pass a stream of cells through, uh, through the flow cytometry. It has a laser or more than one laser. It uh, fires a laser at these, uh, at these cells and you detect properties, the shape, the size, or the, the density of it. Also with these markers that have been fixated on the surface, it, they also get excited at different uh, wavelengths uh, because of the laser and it's, ca it's captured uh, by these detectors. Uh, and these detectors then give a readout for each of the uh, markers that you have uh, uh, prepared or fixated on the surface. Uh, you, you get these by, you get the, the traditional ways to look at these uh, biaxial plots uh, between channels. Uh, but CITOF uh, has also been uh, uh, a great new approach, which uh, gives uh, even more channels. They don't use fluorochromes who have a, this, uh, this issue of uh, stepping on each other, let's say the detectors trying to um, detect exactly which um, um, marker is involved. In the case of a fluorochrome is a, a little bit, not, uh, you need to compensate for it. And there is uh, stepping, foot stepping, let's say they step over each other, there's overlaps causing 
noise in the in the actual detection system uh, and in the analysis. Here um, in flow cytometry, they, they, instead of fluorochromes, they use metal isotopes. Um, and it's much sharper and the detectors are more precise and there's no overlap and no stepping on toes and therefore a cleaner uh, division. It means that you can go up in number of channels. Uh, at the moment, of course, flow cytometry is also increasing and the uh, spectral approaches are now going up to 40 channels. So uh, 28 is then 40 seems to be the standard or possibly you, you have the possibility of using those at the moment. Um, what does this mean in terms of analysis, of course, uh, it, and research opportunities? It's, it's great research opportunity as you increase and you get the uh, refinement and um, you get more um, readouts in terms of characterizing cells. It gives more research possibilities. Um, when you try to do this biaxial gating, that is the traditional port uh, approach, uh, if you have, uh, for example, two to the 40 uh, channels, I think two to the 20 is already a million biaxial gating plots. So you can imagine two to the 40 is, is billions. Uh, so of course that's not achievable um, uh, unless you, you're a robot yourself, but we're human, we couldn't do that. We need new algorithms to be able to handle this. Uh, and there are many from the high dimensional uh, world. Uh, statistical knowledge, which uh, so for traditional flow cytometry people, uh, uh, skills, they need to increase the statistical knowledge or you don't have to become a maths expert, but at least you know how to need to know how they behave these algorithms and uh, what not to do with them. Uh, it's called multivariate uh, analysis uh, to use the statistical term where, um, and the chemioinformatics guys have been doing it for a while. And I can talk a little bit about the technology new terminology. There's also a tool channels a tool challenge, but I see it as an opportunity and that's why I started Tersen. Uh, and there's no standard approach where it's really like a pioneer. And there's also this synergy going on between the cytometry world and the single cell RNA-seq. Uh, similar um, issues and they're both uh, feeding off each other. So it is a wonderful time at the moment with uh, all this data increasing. So some term terminology issues um, or standardizations. The word channel, uh, channel name, sometimes it's said a parameter from the flow community, marker is used by the wet lab people, variable is what's used by statisticians. They talk about the variables and that's the channel. And then there's features used by the machine learning and the AI guys, they, they talk about the features. Uh, it comes from image analysis. Then there's channel measurements, uh, you, we sometimes call expressions or signal, the channel signal. Um, then you talk about dimensions and that's the number of parameters that you're measuring. Um, um, which is related to the channels. Bivariate is two variables versus multivariate, many variables. Uh, an event as the, as the cell is passing through the, in a flow-like manner being detected, it is, causes an event with the laser, that's an event. In statistics, that's called an observation. Um, of course, it's a cell, the flow guys, or the wet lab people call it cell. Sometimes it's referred to as row, as the row, because it's in the data table. Um, a cluster is also another term very, very popular. It's a population from, from the flow community, but a class it's called in the machine learning world. Um, and a label in from the machine learning world. A label not in the wet lab sense, but label as in a name labeling something. Um, uh, and then an algorithm, uh, Tersen, I use the word operator as being synonymous with algorithms. So sometimes you'll hear me call the operator, but not the operator of the machine, but the operator, the computational operator. There's a lot of tools um, out there, which is great, Flojo, uh, which is the most popular at the moment, uh, Kaluza, which also is uh, very flexible, especially with the add-on for the uh, data analysis for Kaluza, FC Express, which has very nice downsampling and uh, um, uh, features that are very relevant. And of course, uh, I, well, this discovery, I've, I've, I've been talking to them for a while. Uh, I really like what they're doing and they have a very high throughput um, and high uh, computing power on uh, doing very fast uh, uh, gating and in terms of scaling up for clinical clinical samples. Then the Cypher Bank, which I like a lot, it's, it's, it's driven by the community. And then there's uh, Tersen, which is what I have started. Um, um, and then um, we took a little different approach to everybody else. Tersen is very much a uh, interaction, exploration, and um, 
I'm trying to be the new type of Excel for the biomedical world. If you're familiar with Tableau from the financial world, I'm trying to be a Tableau of the biological sciences, basically. And here in R and Python, uh, there's, there's great algorithms galore. You need to know a little bit about programming. Well, Tursen, you don't, uh, we plug into all these, um, uh, these algorithms that are coming from R, Python, MATLAB, and Java. Um, Tursen and R and the Python uh, are all free. So please uh, do not hesitate to go and use it. So um, very important here with, uh, so I've been 15 years as, uh, as Derek was mentioning, I've been many years at this multivariate uh, business um, where you have many dimensions and noise is a big issue and false positives, of course, it's, it's also there in the, in the lower dimensions, but um, you can fix problems if you have garbage in, but uh, like batch effects, reagents effects, and they have to be systematic effects. And if the good experimental design there, you can actually, you can recover. Um, but there is a consequence every time you uh, have noise, it can produce it, a consequence in how much time you spend in data analysis. So you can have uh, geometric uh, levels of impact on the amount of time you spend um, on data analysis if, the, if there is a noisy input. So spending time at the start, making sure your controls are there, your experimental design, some static statistical techniques, if the experimental design is good, they can really pull out quite a lot of information. So um, what are the interfering factors for your high dimensional analysis? Really, it's a lot of a technical variation, uh, but also um, you have uh, batch effects, which are systematic variations with reagents, machines on different days, uh, patients, uh, which would be biological, of course, but. Uh, it's a biological variation with patients. Uh, you have to get good experimental design and good controls. Um, so there are a lot of techniques, uh, especially in the multivariate word for correcting for batch, batches. But also I see the cytom cytometry uh, community starting to really embrace this um, um, corrections that you can do. Um, so the analysis work workflow is basically uh, remove the doublets, the debris, the dead cells that could be passing through this flow uh, with these events. Um, you can do this with uh, Calusa, with Flojo, with Venturi One, which is one of the uh, products in, uh, in Discovery Suite. And you could uh, export it as CVS, you upload the data to Tursen, you down sample if necessary, you transform your data, you quality control, you overview your data, you normalize for these batch effects uh, if you need to. Sometimes the statistical technique will know how to uh, cater for these uh, systematic effects uh, if the experimental design is well balanced. And then you have uh, clustering, um, which is what we're gonna be talking about as well, um, where you, you, you split up your population into groups and you explore and you validate these groups and you find targets or bio, bio, uh, biomarker targets. Uh, this is potentially sometimes you're only happy with or you're, you're okay with just uh, classifying phenotypically uh, the populations. But uh, I see may, much, much more data coming now with, uh, with actually going after biomarkers. So uh, that's what I'll approach. So um, this is the, this is the um, what I think is the state of affairs of tools where uh, it's been a progression. Prism and Excel have been doing really well and are very well and are fantastic. Uh, and they have been helping, the, I don't know how many PhD students they've helped, but uh, it, it's, it's staggering. And I think it's time for a new generation. I mean, with, you can, I still need Excel and Prism, but Tursen is this uh, interactive exploratory approach to, uh, so it's like Excel on steroids in a way. Um, and uh, you can use all of these tools instead of replacing them, but Tursen I think is the next step. It's, it's totally web-based um, and it's quite fast. Uh, we have uh, this uh, binary indexing. That's, I think, uh, really cool. So when you upload your uh, CSV, you start to create your projections, you look at your data. I have data sets in this whole webinar called uh, B-Cell data sets that I'll show, a PBMC, two PBMC ones. Um, and I will show you some of the concepts of Tursen especially the variables. I'll go to Terse now. I'm going there uh, presently. So I clicked on, it's, it's, it's based on, on, the, on the cloud. If you're familiar with GitHub, we basically uh, copied some of their concepts of GitHub because GitHub is for uh, developers, but we wanted to make this tool accessible to all biologists who may not have the time to learn 
programming. So you go to here, here I'm in Tursen now and I'm in a project. I created a webinar team and I'm in the presentation project. In the project I have data tables, which are these squares here, but I also have uh, workflows, which are with these icons. And I will be going through this. You, you, you basically can make, uh, you can upload data here and you can create workflows. I'm gonna create a workflow now just to talk about the concepts uh, of uh, and why I think uh, person is a little bit different, but for high dimensional data, this is really cool. So I've created a workflow, it opens up completely empty, and now I can add um, the data table, which basically means the data. So I can now add the, ta the table, and it says, which table do you want? I'm gonna take the B cells because it's a indicative, uh, it's, a to it's, a, it's a data set that came with Flow AI, but it sh has a time element, and it's there just to show you the principles. So I have, uh, it's gone green, it's imported, and now I can add and add a data step, which is a projection. You can make any projection you want of your data and you can apply any operator. In this case, it comes up uh, totally, uh, um, it's waiting for a definition. I'm gonna save it here with the little diskette. I'll just go over here, I'll show you that it's added a step called data step, and I'll click it and I'm into this projection. Um, so in the projection, you can, once you've uploaded your file, your table, uh, you have all these, um, this information that comes from the file that you have uploaded. In this case, you have the measurement, the channel measurement, the time uh, that the measurement was taken, the event ID, the file name that it came from, and the channel, the type of channel it came from. So if I take measurement, I can drag it over from the left and put it anywhere here in this projection. I can put it as a row concept, a y-axis concept, x-axis, or a column. I'll put it as a, as a, um, as a um, y-axis concept. So this is all the measurements of all the channels being put in one cell here. And it's automatically ordered where you have the lowest magnitude to the left and the highest to the right. Um, I can put channel here, which is the name of the channel. I could put it up here uh, in, in a column concept, but I'll put it as a row concept because uh, that's also what the um, genomic guys do, um, where you put the variable, which is the channel on the row, and you're putting, um, which I will do now, the um, time as the column. So this is the observation in the terminology. And you notice that you have two data points, um, which is different from Excel. Excel, you can only have one point in, in a cell here. You, have two, you can have two points in a cell. So you can see at this time point, there were in this channel or in this whole uh, time point, there are two measurements uh, or two cells. And to separate that, you would have to bring in another concept here, which is the event ID. Uh, and I can put the event ID above the time or below the time. I'll put it below the time because I want to keep the time ordering. And you see now it, have, it has individual event IDs. So now I can look at my data very interactively and very fast. As I mentioned, this indexing technology. So you can you can look at the overview of your data. You can see the y-axis here is, is, is outlined in the view. Uh, and you can uh, now start, uh, well, you could make, you can start computing on it or you can continue looking at it. For example, in the measurement, I might color by the measurement, the magnitude, and I can go into heat map mode just to look. So this is showing the different channels. You can see how strong uh, the forward scatter area and height is, is, is high and how the, the side scatters are at a different level to the rest because red is very high in magnitude in the signal, uh, green is in the middle and red is at, and blue is at the, the low, at the low part. So if you want to compute on this, uh, you can take this projection and you give it a computation. We have many computations from Python and R. Uh, I'm going to use uh, the uh, arc sign, um, which is the typical transformation that you do it. Uh, and I'm going to use a scaling of 15, which is uh, recommended for site of data, for, sorry, for uh, flow data and, fif and five for site of data. This is flow data. Um, and so I've used 15. So I've now, I can run it within the projection, which I just did here. I can go back, uh, I'll save the workflow, but I'll go back here and it's running. I'll rename this to, uh, to, to, uh, uh, ACID H, which is the transformation that I did. Um, and I will save it. And now I can do uh, another a projection based on the output. And this is what the beauty of Tursen is. In this case is for high dimensional data. This is very handy, is that you can look at the output, which is in this case, um, looking exactly, if you notice the projection has been done for me, where now we're looking at the, um, I'll color on the transform data 
and I'll go into a heat map mode and you'll see the, that the data has been transformed. But if, look, notice on the left, every time you do a computation or an algorithm, you get extra um, entries here on the left and you can drag them over and do exactly different, um, uh, do extra projections, especially in the high dimensional. So if you have many dimensions here, you can start manipulating them. So I've just done a transformation and, you, and it has changed the, the color, of course, because the magnitudes have changed and this is a transformation. So um, that's the concepts and it is very powerful. You can build up uh, like flow uh, clustering, you build it up into uh, steps like this, you interact with it and you run the different algorithms. Uh, so I will go back to the presentation and, um, uh, and, and talk about the first type of operation. Well, we've seen one operation already, the transformation operation, the ASIN, but this is a second type where you downsample, you, down you can downsample before the transformation or after. Um, you do. You usually do it for performance reasons. A lot of people can't, uh, like for example, Tisney takes a lot of time, but uh, you would uh, downsample. You reduce the number of events. You, you try to balance. You also downsampling can balance in events across samples in case you have more events from one patient and less events and you want to make sure you're comparing apples with uh, oranges. Uh, you may lose the rare populations. Um, I, I tend to not downsample because I have a very performant uh, Tisney. A, it's called approximate Tisney, a Tisney, so I don't have to do this. But there are different ways to downsample to try and not lose uh, these um, the structure of your original data. Basically, you can use a random or uniform distribution uh, where you, you 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 don't mind how frequent certain values are. You can use a density base where you, you uh, prioritize the more frequent uh, measurements and you can inversely density base where you're prioritizing the least frequent uh, measurements, which would be interesting if you have rare populations. Uh, then you move on to Flow AI. It's a package uh, that looks for surges. It needs a time element in the projection in, in and even in so you need to have a time factor and it's, it checks out to, to see if there are surges. For example, if you go to, uh, to Tursen, which I just did there, you see here, this is the Flow AI being used. And if I open Flow AI uh, here, you will see the, the channels, but, uh, and I've also used the projection, the same projection as I did before. And you can see that there is a surge going on here or uh, a flow issue. Uh, in time and the later time points here. And when you run uh, Flow AI, you basically uh, look at the output of Flow AI and Flow AI gives you a, f a flag that you can add here and kick out and you can see I've kicked out the, kicked out the, um, the surge at the end. So um, Flow AI is great. I have Flow Clean as well, but um, if you have a cleaning algorithm that you'd like to add, it's, uh, it's easy for us, and so please contact us. But basically, Flow AI and Flow Clean is what is used. Now we're talking about dimension reduction. Dimension reduction is really, um, it's quite uh, abstract, but uh, finding patterns in, most humans can handle two dimensions, three dimensions, but handling 13, 40, your, your mind explodes, especially if you're trying to find patterns. Um, you need a new method to be able to take whatever is expressed or the data structure that's expressed in the 40 dimensions or the 40 markers and to bring it down to two dimensions. So as we can plot it on the screen uh, or three dimensions, um, sometimes I bring it down to five because I use these pairwise plots in the PCA, but uh, most people will only bring it down to two. So you're trying to take this 40 dimension uh, space and bring it down to a two dimension space so you can look at uh, the data. Uh, and you want to do this without losing uh, structure, which of course you can imagine that's a big uh, reduction in dimensions. Um, and so you, you have to keep the structure as much as possible, especially the variation that's in there and the, the distances between the data points need to be respected. And I'll talk about that a little bit now. Um, there are many, there are many uh, algorithms uh, out there for it. Uh, the PCA has been there since 1901 and I use it a, a lot, but it's not so good with uh, Flow Cyto um, in, in, for using on the markers, but I'll talk about this a little bit later. Uh, and then you have this whole family of Tisneys. I mentioned the approximate Tisney is the one that I put in. It's, it's from the guys from uh, Lawrence uh, uh, and the Leiden group uh, who were the ones who started the Tisney uh, here in Holland in, in uh, Delft University and Leiden University. And then there is a fast Tisney here, which is a 2017, and then UMAP, which is uh, really the new kid on the block. Uh, uh, and it is uh, 
fascinating to see how this is uh, developing. Uh, they, they, they differ in the way they do whether they're linear or nonlinear. PCA is a linear. So for example, here's a, to a little toy example. If you had two markers, uh, which represents two dimensional, and you wanted to go to one dimension, then you can understand a little bit how, uh, what it means to go from 40 to, to two. But here's two dimensions, and you're trying, these circles represent populations of uh, cells, and you want to go to one dimension, and one dimension is this line here. You want a line to be able to separate these, uh, to, to separate these, or keep the structure of these populations. Uh, if you project these populations onto the new component, we call it, or the new dimension, you'll be able to separate all these populations by projecting them directly onto the line. You'll be able to see that this, this is a, a, a population one, population two, three, and four, and it'll be separate uh, zones on the line as you project them onto this new uh, uh, dimension, this one, one dimension. And it's a linear, this line, it's a line, so it's a linear combination of these two markers, and you can do this. But if you have a populations that have this kind of Swiss roll, um, um, uh, and it's called a manifold, is a technical word, but the Swiss roll is also a, a very interesting technical word for me. But uh, they, the populations are linked here, and you use a, a one dimension, but this time the one dimensions are in this nonlinear combination of markers. You can draw a curve that follows uh, through these uh, uh, clusters and you project on these lines, you'll be, you'll be, you'll, you can imagine that these, these uh, projections on this line, you'll also be able to separate uh, the population. So this is the nonlinear view. And um, UMAP is nonlinear and TISNI is nonlinear. And the traditional way in the multivariate world has been very linear. Uh, so, but the uh, flow, flow seems to be very much nonlinear. Uh, here's another toy example about uh, these techniques and how they can deform when you go from a high dimension to a low dimension. But uh, this is done by Nikolai Oskolov. I think he's a postdoc in Lund, uh, in SciLife, uh, in Sweden. And he, did, he took a toy data, which uh, two, two, it's not two markers, but it's latitude and longitude. And he, he, um, he basically uh, did the world map um, and he pushed it through the different uh, algorithms that do reduction. Uh, PCA performed very well. Well, it's unfair because it is a, uh, a linear uh, problem. So PCA did perform. But uh, look how uh, TISNI performed. Uh, TISNI also uh, was able to keep the, uh, the structure. What I mean by the structure is the global. It's the how other continents uh, um, related in terms of to each other, but also the shape or the, the within, we call that local, the within cluster shape. So you can see here the global, um, it, it kind of screwed up with the uh, South America here, now is being put between Africa, um, or sorry, between North America and Africa, uh, while UMAP, which is on the top, on the bottom right, preserved the relationship with, uh, with all of this with, in terms of South America and North America. And also it preserved better the shape. So you can see UMAP is a much more improvement. And if, if you're doing this in the 50 dimensions, UMAP will perform equally well here. PCA will not. So this is a summary of exactly how they, uh, how they um, compare. Uh, TISNI has this perplexity, which uh, basically uh, allows you to uh, parameterize this local versus global uh, issue uh, and uh, they can, it can go from five to ten and it's uh, recommended to be the square root of the number of n's what 50 is the maximum that you can go here UMAP doesn't have so much of this uh, issue uh, and it tends to work it out much tighter and easier uh, PCA uh, has uh, I use PCA but not on uh, the markers but uh, on other areas of the data analysis uh, I can show you this in Tursen uh, if, if here I've done a TISNI, a UMAP, and a PCA, um, and if you look at TISNI, uh, how it performs, or maybe I should do PCA first, but this is a TISNI plot. You can see how spread every, uh, all the populations are. These are the different populations in this data set, the PBMC data set, uh, and this has been manually uh, annotated or manually um, uh, found these gates. Uh, so it shows you uh, that it uh, does a good job of separating them, but this, the size of the, the actual local and global structure is not there. However, if you look at, P, at uh, UMAP, UMAP uh, has much tighter. Um, it also um, has respected the uh, global distances as well. Um, 
as well as local distances, uh, much tighter projection because of how it uh, handles. Um, I won't go into the details, but it basically is is way better at preserving that that, that global and local structure. PCA, if you do on the PBMC data, you see that it fails uh, in that it can't separate. There's a lot of overlap. Uh, even the shape, uh, local and global, is uh, is is not preserved because of the linear approach. So I go uh, back here. Um, and I will continue here. So um, now we move on to the next part, which is cell clustering. Um, cell clustering, there's, this is where you spend, people spend a lot of time, grouping of cells in populations. You've already seen it a little bit with the uh, clustering and the reduction. It, it can be sensitive to batch effects. Um, for example, if you have reagents and it, it increases the overall signal for a bunch of uh, cells, um, you're, clustering can pick up on this. So variation is an issue, issue here and you have to, uh, for example, it'll find out different patient groups rather than different uh, uh, phenotypic cell populations uh, when you apply it on, on, on data that has been, uh, has a large bat effect. So many types of clustering. And by axial, this is the one that uh, is the workhorse of, uh, and it's fantastic. Uh, uh, and it's since 1972, uh, however, it, can't uh, for 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 high dimensions it's uh, it's not you're not able to do it spade was the one of the first uh, clustering which came and it also gave tree how the lineage of the clusters look like so spade has this lineage or tree hierarchy concept citrus flow density phenograph x shift x shift uh, performed very well in in rare cell population flow sum uh, and i'll move on to the next one actually the flow sum algorithm performed very well in a 2016 paper, which I'll talk about, uh, Harkel's Tisney, uh, Hisney, uh, the same group as the Tisney guys, flow grid, uh, which is uh, being driven or just came about, uh, or 2018, from the single cell or a seq world. Uh, this paper, Weber and Al from the Robinson Lab in 2016, he went through 18 clustering, six data sets, um, four from Cytoff and two from Flow, and they, he has this F1 score. Uh, where he, uh, F1 score of one means there's a perfect match between um, manual gating and automated gating, and a zero meaning a mismatch um, between the two. And this is only for one data set, there's six data sets, but uh, you see flow sum here is on the left, it has the highest F score. Uh, the green here is also a false positive and blue is false negative. So you can see there's a little bit of false positives going on here. Uh, and then on the right, they, he, uh, Lucas also did a timing, um, and you can see FlowSum performs very well in terms of computation, which is another aspect of flow. So FlowSum seems to be the one everyone is going for at the moment. Um, so principles of FlowSum, it's a self-organizing map. We did this at university uh, many years ago. It's a neural net, but it's uh, very effective in FlowCyto. It can give you a tree relationship, a lineage also of, of, uh, of clusters. And uh, when you're using FlowSum, some advice is that the number of clusters uh, can be automatically determined by FlowSum, but they, it's usually under, under, uh, um, underrepresents the number of clusters. You can set it manually, of course, then if you set it manually, you need to know what to set it to. It's better to overcluster than to undercluster. Uh, it's also stochastic, meaning if you run flow sum um, repetitively, it'll give different answers, which might uh, um, perturb you, but it's actually showing the stability aspect and uh, it's worth uh, keep running flow sums to see this, how it changes. Um, it gives you an indicate, one, it gives you an indication of how stable your clusters and two, it might throw up some clusters that are rare in one of the runs. If, you're, if you have a publication, of course, you can set the seed to a particular level and it will repeat exactly the same uh, clustering. So you can do flow some on the markers, which is, or a subset of the markers of your data. So not all markers, let's say, but you can also do use flow some on the output of the uh, dimension reduction algorithms. Um, so you go, uh, if I go to Tursen at the moment, uh, I'll show you this. Here's flow sum, it's, there's a transformation and then there's a flow sum and then there's a, uh, a view here. Um, flow sum is, it basically goes through the projection I just showed you and labels which ones are, and, and I've told to flow sum to, to find seven 
clusters and it's done a, a multivariate, it's a multivariate technique because it uses all the markers to find the seven clusters and I've ordered the clusters here. Um, um, so flow sum and you, you, you basically set it in the parameters here among others, but you can set seven. Uh, how, why did I say seven? This was an example seven, but I'll show you uh, another example where um, I'll show you one example first uh, where you're using it not on the markers, uh, like in here, here, this is a, a uh, Tursin workflow where the UMAP has been performed and then FlowSum has been performed on the UMAP. Um, and I told FlowSum to use seven and you see how perfect it is, of course. That's because the UMAP had seven, um, if you remember, it had seven clusters uh, and FlowSum was able to pick up the clusters on top of the UMAP, but beware of this approach. This is doing flow sum on the reduced uh, dimension space. So you will lose a lot of information. While in the previous example, I uh, flow sum was ran on the original full marker space, the full uh, number, which were, I can't remember how many markers I had, but it was definitely more than two, which is being run here uh, with these two components. Um, I guess, um, I could talk a little bit more about it, but let's uh, move on to some this, this big question about overclustering and underclustering. How good are your clusters? Um, at the moment, the best way to judge your clustering is to look at the marker profiles of each of the clusters to actually find out are they what what markers are highly expressed in them and how homogeneous are these markers in the clusters. And, uh, and it, these clusters can be given scores. There are many types of scores like uh, MEM scores, but you can also give them scores and just do the medium, uh, a marker per cluster, give them median value or a, a CV value or a range value, an IQR interquantile range, give a homogeneous, how homogeneous are they? Or look at the profile of the markers per cluster. Um, you can also use bivariate plots again with the clusters. Um, and these clusters also can be used for your biomarker analysis if you test between clusters. So there's lots of um, ways of using the clusters, but also characterizing the cluster. One, one that I want to share with you, which, um, uh, was given to me by um, the flow group in in Crick, but it's actually developed in um, by Kirsten Diggins in the Irish, uh, Irish uh, John, Jonathan Irish in the uh, he's I, the Irish lab uh, in Vanderbilt University, and it's called a MEM score, and it gives a score per cluster per per, per marker of plus ten. 0 or minus 10, a range, a range, a number like this going from plus 10 to minus 10. And it's a little equ equation here where you look at the median value of that marker per cluster, you compare it with the median values of, of that marker against all the other clusters. So it gives you a range of how expressed this marker is, plus it, it gives this factor here and it says how homogeneous this marker is as well. It uses this interquantile range of the um, other clusters divided by this one, the one that you're actually looking at, the, the cluster in question, and you get a score. So a, a big score of 10 means that it's uh, highly expre expressed and um, it's also homogeneous. And the blue would mean that it's uh, depleted or uh, much lower than all the rest of uh, the clusters. So you, uh, these MEM scores are, of course, they're you. you they're very readable, uh, very understandable, and you can use these MEM scores to actually appraise your clusters and you can perform analysis on the scores like a PCA, like a distance analysis. So P MEM scores themselves now be can become um, computable as such. So um, uh, the MEM scores, maybe I should show that um, in person. Um, let me just go back. My connection is a bit slow and I'll just click here. Um, so here is a, a, a flow sum with an N equal to seven and an N equal to uh, uh, 90 to show you the difference of what, how to appraise this. If you look at the flow sum, it's the, the one I showed already where I've taken this projection and I've applied flow sum to all of the events and all of the markers. I could have used only a subset of markers here. Uh, and then I've, uh, the output of flow sum is clusters. And then I've put it into MEM, the MEM score operator. 
And uh, the memscore operator needs to know the clusters that was coming out from the flow sum, which is that's why the clusters up here, that those clusters come from flow sum. I've also colored by clusters, so as you can see, there's uh, 90 clusters here. And these, uh, this is, uh, uh, then you execute this and for, you basically get this heat map of uh, mem scores for each, each cluster, there's 90 clusters here. And you get a, a very dark red if it's enriched, a very dark blue if it's uh, depleted. Uh, and there's 90 clusters here. You can actually start looking at, we call this a profile, a marker profile, and you try to see which ones are similar, which clusters have the same profile. And you can do this with a hierarchical clustering. So we're computing on the MEM scores now uh, and using a, another um, uh, high dimension or multivariate technique uh, called hierarchical clustering. It's, uh, you have uh, various forms of it, but I've used the simplest form. Um, and I log the MEM scores here just to show you have a visual. Uh, and it puts on the columns are all the clusters and on the rows are all the markers. And you can see that they're uh, putting all the clusters that are similar based on the MEM scores. And you see this block effect, like here, there's a block here that look very similar MEM scores, another block here. So you can see the blocks one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or seven, you can argue this one, it is different. So you, here out of the 90 clusters, there's really only seven major groupings. These are called dendrograms. Uh, I can talk about them later, but they basically give you a feeling of how tight these, uh, how tight uh, this grouping is. Um, so it means you can go back to the workflow and you can build another branch here and put uh, flow sum equal to uh, n equals seven, run the same uh, mem score on the seven. Now there's less colors, of course, because they're, um, and the mem score is run, and then you get a heat map coming back. And here you see uh, individual, uh, you can see, um, uh, the seven clusters and each with the mem scores. If you go to the hierarchical clustering, which we were looking at, uh, um, then you'll see, I'll just log it here as well, make it a bit smaller. You see the profiles are much distinct uh, and, and there's no blocks happening. Well, you could argue there's a block here, but you see that there are markers that are, are different. Uh, this one here, uh, CD11C is actually different and there's a, for example, here, this marker is different. So, um, so this would uh, would suggest that seven seven is a good a good set of mar uh, group for this, and you would do that iteratively. Um, so I'll go back here to the, the to, to finalize on them. The mem scores they're very uh, machine readable and usable. So you can also um, do this differential analysis I mentioned when you do these clusters, um, and you don't have to use all the markers I mentioned, you could use some markers, especially the ones who are lineage to use to, to use flow sum on the lineage markers to get uh, the population or phenotypic population. Um, but you can also use some of them to do this next step, which is the cellular state markers represent the molecular state of these uh, populations. And you can use a, an operator like DIFSIT from Lucas, the same the same guy who did the analysis of the um, of all the cluster uh, algorithms. He has a great uh, public repository, and it's really good science in terms of transparency. But uh, he all there. He's his colleague uh, Malgor Zolta, also from uh, Mark Robinson's lab in uh, in Zurich, uh, the Zurich Hospital UZH uh, has a detailed workflow. And it can particularly handle paired effects and batch effects. Um, and it's particularly good at, uh, at using experimental design. I'll just show it to you a little bit. Uh, I want to show you um, here. I've just loaded up one of their data sets that they have. Uh, and I've used the clinical data or the clinical factors that came in from the original data and I've ordered and uh, I've done a transformation of the data. Uh, and you can see that there are markers that are uh, for the molecular state and there are markers for the ones who are lineage, which are below. There are two types of markers. But um, what's interesting here is the patient effect. You can see some patients are stronger. Patient two here is stronger as patient, patient three, and, uh, three and four look stronger. Patient five looks weaker. Um, and so there is a patient batch effect or biological it's not really technically a batch effect, but it's a biological effect, model effect, 
of patients, and the the question of what's uh, which markers have changed the most between the treated, the, the perturbation, right, the control and treatment group here. Uh, the, the nice thing about this site that uh, I mentioned is able to pick up on uh, the uh, these is able to capitalize on the structure. You can tell the stats that this, there's a patient effect and that there's a treatment and control group and it'll find out, uh, it's like a sophisticated t-test basically um, or a two-way ANOVA. Uh, but um, so now um, I will just uh, um, talk a little bit about, um, you can also integrate um, uh, many, many readouts uh, effectively from um, from if you have phenotypic uh, readouts from the flow the flow world uh, you might also have uh, cytokine readouts prol proliferation readouts and you can integrate that in tersen uh, and then you can use the same metaphor the same approach we have this join step here that you see in my on the screen it joins the marker information the sample information the patient information just like in the boda miller there uh, and you're, you can do, you can explore your clinical, the clinical aspects in the tr translational, uh, which your translational research question. Uh, just this one, I added the slide just to to let people know that once you've run your cytometer, you run your your your, uh, you remove your debris and your dead cells and um, and you basically uh, use Flojo with Lusa or Venturi one, and you export it as a CSV file or a tab delimited file, you upload it to Tursen. Tursen is on the cloud. Uh, it is for, is for free and it has these plugins that we can we can modify plugins for you or uh, these operators. And what's nice about it is that the bioinformatician and the biologist can work together on a workflow. Bioinformaticians can upload uh, uh, whatever operator, like I used one from Crick called the flu, uh, tune, uh, flow, flow some tuning operator so as the researcher could use it. Uh, they, the researcher is it, so the bioinformatician is not a bottleneck. The researcher can actually use all the tools. The bioinformatician, the bioinformatician can uh, supervise the researcher, and they can do their workflow and download the data, export it, or uh, take a, the graphics from Tursen. So this is my summary. Uh, you can spend time on experiment. Uh, spending time on experimental design is, is important. Get rid of debris, doublets, and dead cells. Look at your data. You can see quite a lot of uh, artifacts in your data or, or batch effects. Avoid downsampling. Well, you don't have to avoid, but sometimes you, you need to do downsampling for balancing effects. Uh, uh, so maybe the word avoid is a bit strong here, but downsampling, uh, if you need, if you don't need to do it, you don't have to. Uh, watch out for batch effects, uh, run flow sum repeatedly to check the stability. Overclustering is better than underclustering because then you can work downwards like I showed you with the n equal 90 going to n equal 7. Calculate mem scores is a good way of appraising your, your clusters. Uh, uh, use your domain knowledge because a lot of these multivariate techniques are, they're not religious about which marker they use. Some markers are more important than others that, because that's your domain knowledge and they treat all markers equally. You could argue that's a good thing, but uh, you have to use your domain knowledge to, to appraise. Uh, enjoy, explore. Uh, I hope Tursen is, 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 is enjoyable for you. I made it so as it's, uh, you can play with this high dimensionality. Uh, it's your pioneers and it's free and don't hesitate to contact us. Um, my name is of course Faris here. This is my contact um, and you can always do a one-to-one -one session or we can uh, personalize it. Um, I guess that's it. Uh, Derek, um, it's over to you. Okay, thanks, Ferris. Um, I just want to put the final slide on while, while we do the Q&A. Yeah, so before we go into the questions and answers, hopefully, um, just a, a reminder that you can find out all about the upcoming webinars from the CRIC at the CRIC What's On page, and as well as following uh, me on CRIC training, you might also like to follow the RMS, Royal Microscopical Society, and Flow Cytometry UK as well, who also have a lot of useful resources, especially during this time. Now, at the end of this, um, what I will do is I'll send uh, a link to this uh, webinar, but also a link to our, play, our YouTube playlist, which contains all of the other webinars we've given over the past few months. Um, so, now's the time to ask Ferris a few questions well, while we have him here. And I, I suppose the question that we get asked a lot in the lab is, you know, I've, I'm used to flow cytometry data. I'm used to understanding the, the, the structure of that. And it's mm -hmm. a big leap 
going in this leap of faith almost going into high mm. dimensional data analysis and, and what i always mm. suggest to people is it's good to have some data that you understand mm -hmm. before you do that so you know are there good recommended data sets that you would recommend i you showed some there yeah so of course your own data set is is the best one to upload as you just mentioned because you know it uh i've showed i've shown a few i took one from the Kirsten Diggins from the Jonathan Irish lab and there are around six in the MEM scores which are very nice because they've been manually gated they've been they're trying to make the case for the MEM scores and um, it's all about population identification and then Lucas uh, Weber uh, from uh, from in Zurich or he's not in Zurich anymore but uh, the, the Mark Robinson lab they have around um, I think uh, 20 data sets on uh, for population identification, rare, rare, popula rare population identification as well, and also simulated data. Lovely data sets. I, 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 I basically fell in love with uh, Lucas Weber's online repository because it, it, he basically did a great work in, in putting everything there so you can, it's a resource that's, um, I'd like to emulate uh, with Tursen, where you can have these um, data sets that you show your algorithm, but also it's pedagogic. Yeah, aspects. Yeah. Uh, I think another sort of fear factor, if you like, of doing the multi-dimensional mm. analysis is that the field seems to be moving very quickly. Yeah. Everybody was using Flowsum, you now XShift seems to be coming to the fore, you know, for yeah. Disney, now it's UMAP. You know, how do we <laughs> keep up with that? Yes, it's a moving target. So uh, you need a tool. Uh, yeah, the tool has to keep up. So um, uh, XShift is a, it's a Java-based tool. So um, I should actually incorporate it into Tursen. So luckily our architecture allows us to incorporate it, but you have to keep up to date. Yeah. So, um, but you, you, you ask you for advice. Um, sometimes it's too early to, to jump from flow, flow sum to X shift, for example, uh, because you also need guidance. So the, um, so the, the best advice is, is li literature publications um, is the only way to keep up. You have to keep reading them otherwise, or you, go to Tursen and use the operator there. Um, but I will put XShift on, online. It's a Java-based one and it would have to be incorporated. But you're, it's, it's, it's a challenge. Um, I don't have an easy answer there. Uh, you have to keep up. And it's also part of the fun, isn't it? It's not just a... Uh, <laughs> of course. <laughs> uh, yes, and uh, Disney, for example, pioneered for the flow cytometry world, but Facebook are using it now. So there's a whole sequence of events that happen with an algorithm. It's not just flow. Uh, now the single cell RNA seq, um, they're coming up with algorithms, and a lot of Python guys are getting involved, with, which are been, uh, have been has been traditionally uh, or guys. Yeah, I suppose you know, a, a flow data file ultimately is just a string of numbers, isn't it? So the way yeah, that that's yeah, dealt but, with is dealt with in lots of other areas of biology yeah, they, and, and life, like you say. Yes, exactly. So the, the variables, which are the observations or the events, and the features, which are the uh, channels, it's it, it's there since Young's this structure. Um, it's not a flow uh, problem, it's a multivariate problem. Uh, in the genomic world, they have 20, uh, 22,000 features, uh, channels, 22,000, and they have 1,000 observations. Um, in a biotech that I'm working with, it has 200 um, uh, features and a, th uh, a million um, uh, observations. So the the, the, the structure is the same, but maybe the proportions are not. Um, and the algorithm, and of course, whether they're, it's a linear or nonlinear is based on the um, type of uh, technology. For example, in the case of flow cytometry, the nonlinear approach is working well. But in the case of the biotech that I was dealing with, the linear uh, dimension reduction was working. But um, hopefully that gives you a bit of an insight. Am I talking too much? I could go on at length. I, I'll give you one final question. About, uh, you know, I, I suppose the uh, the thing is, is you need to be aware of the pros and cons of all these things, don't you? So one of your slides showed yeah. that, which was which was quite nice. And yeah. interestingly, you mentioned about downsampling and yes. avoiding it if you can. And you know that's something that's always been a bit of a yeah. issue, I think, especially if you're looking for rare events, which a lot of people are in these, yeah. that, you know, could potentially miss them by doing yes. that. Yes, and FC Express is a very good downsampler. Um, uh, so knowing what sound sampler you're using, but um, you may want to down, down sample because I mentioned, so the, it, there is, you want to lose events because uh, of the fact that one patient has more events than another patient. So uh, you purposely want to lose events, but if you're interested in rare, rare events or rare cells, yes, you have to be very careful. Um, 
I, if you don't need to do it, don't do it. Uh, but I see most of the reasons people do it are maybe because of Tisney takes so long, it takes hours. So you then take 10% of your data or 1% of your data. Um, and I'm not sure if that's a good reason. Of course, uh, I have a Tisney, the approximate Tisney in person, so that would that would solve some of your problems. Uh, using a, a 60 C, a CPU system uh, while you have your coffee is another solution to to uh, Tisney. So there are other, um, and I can help you with that by the way. Um, but um, there are other uh, there are solutions for the tis the performance issue, and I wouldn't, of course. You have to be practical, but downsampling is one way of, of being practical. Sure. And if you do downsample, you should downsample a couple of times because uh, a lot of the algorithms, are, well, not all of them. So actually, some of some of them are deterministic. So it is that when you downsample, it's the same ones that actually. But you you have to be careful. They they could be a random element, and they're non. Uh, deterministic, meaning they're stochastic, meaning that every time you downsample, you will get a different um, uh, set of uh, subpopulations. Then you have to look, and you might get one time the rare event. Sometimes you don't get the rare event, and then so that becomes a factor in your analysis, the stability of your process, you know, of your workflow. So, great. Okay. Thank you, Ferris. I don't think there's any more questions there. So great. thank you once again, and obviously your contact details are on that slide, and yeah. You Showed them and hopefully people will get in contact with you if they want to have a go and and you can always contact me if you've got any other questions no oh, well i appreciate um, it and i appreciate everybody that they spent an hour listening to me i really do and thanks, thanks derek for inviting me and i yeah. think your, your initiative with the webinars are fantastic thank you and thank you all for coming everybody and hopefully we'll see you on another webinar soon so thanks very much bye